Hi, my name is Nina West, and I'm so excited to be here today at the Columbus Museum of Art. Today, I have the honor and privilege of being able to take a tour of this amazing exhibition, Art After Stonewall. This exhibition was launched last year in New York City to help celebrate and commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. It was also launched during World Pride. So I want to tell you a little bit about this exhibition as we get started to take the tour. This show is incredibly important to Columbus, Ohio. We have worked on it for nearly a decade. And I want to tell you how it got started. We were working on a project with Jonathan Weinberg, who is a very noted art historian. And he was in Columbus and he said, you know, you have a great LGBTQ community here. You should organize an exhibition around the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. And we thought, that's a great idea. And Jonathan, of course, made that possible. He was the one, this, is, this whole exhibition is his brainchild. Now, it's a huge exhibition. It's got 240 plus works in it, and it has 165 artists. So you can imagine, someone said to me, why did you just pick 1969 to 1989? Well, there are 240 works in the show, and we only cover two decades. So you have to put you know, a stake in the ground somewhere to figure out when you're gonna start and when you're gonna end. The important thing to remember about 1969 to 1989, it was still very much a, a white male art world. It was the male artists that uh, were represented in collections, with few exceptions. There were some women artists, but they were the ones that had art dealers that represented and sold their works. They're the ones that got exhibitions. So we wanted to honor that. That's part of our history. But there were many other artists. There were women artists. There were trans artists. There were artists of color, all of them hiding in plain sight. They were working. They were doing important work. So we wanted this exhibition to truly have that rich diversity of artists and rich diversity of voices. And so what ends up happening with this show is we're celebrating all of the creative energy that comes out of the early gay rights movement and how it changed the culture of our country and the world and how it changed the art world. As a Columbus resident and native, I am so beyond proud of the Columbus Museum of Art and its team, led by Nanette, to pull this exhibition off and make us aware and celebrate these voices. Art is about putting a stake in the ground and it's about raising and amplifying voices. And this is the largest exhibition of any kind like this, the largest exhibition of LGBTQ artists anywhere in the country ever. And it's done right here in Columbus, Ohio. That is something to celebrate. But if you're someone who's not comfortable coming to the museum yet, you can watch this great tour online and there's a wonderful book that accompanies the exhibition that we recommend. So I believe we're gonna get started. We're gonna to go to our first stop together. Here we go. I'm honored to be standing here with David Stark, the chief curator right here at the Columbus Museum of Art, and to be standing next to what might not be the largest sculpture in the exhibition, but maybe one of the most powerful by Tommy Lanigan Schmidt. Can you talk about this piece and what it means to this exhibition? Indeed, uh, and I'm very happy to be able to talk to you about the wonderful art in this particular space that is directly connected to the Stonewall Riot, that momentous night in June 1969. So as Nina said, this is a work that was created by somebody who was part of that incident, uh, Tommy Lanigan Smith, an artist who actually created this work called um, Allegory of the Stonewall Riot, its subtitled Statue of Liberty. Um, he had this piece that was constructed of so many, we would call them found objects, that include foil and glitter and uh, magic marker and little toys. There's a little toy house. There's some bumblebees, maybe queen bees. Um, there's a spoon. And he, uh, after the, uh, the momentous night of the riot, um, he thought, apparently thought about, well, this really, um, to him, could become a symbol of that incident. And so he subsequently titled this um, Stonewall 
uh, the allegory of the Stonewall Riot Statue of Liberty because the overall shape to him suggested the Statue of Liberty. And there are references in the work to the kinds of straight values, uh, marriage, middle-class domesticity that he mocks or sends up if you look closely at the work. Uh, the little toy house, there's a picture of a boxer, and the subtitle of the work is Fighting for Drag Queen Husband and Home, <laughs> which has a lot of humor and irreverence to it. So it's a really fun work, it's a pretty work, and it's an important work because it really is um, all about the, um, the, the celebration, the protest of that really momentous night. And directly to the right of this work is a photograph that shows the artist himself standing with other, uh, since he was part of the protest, standing with other participants in the riot. They were photographed outside the Stonewall Inn within a day or a few days after the incident. And it is, um, we're proud to say, a work, a photograph that was acquired by the museum, as is the case of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, both these works were acquired by the museum uh, following the opening of the exhibition in New York. That's what often happens with special exhibitions um, when they come to th this museum, uh, as happens in other museums as well. Um, uh, certain works uh, the museum acquires and they become part of the permanent collection so that we'll always have them. Now, I have to ask the question. I'm first so proud that this now calls Columbus home and Tommy's art calls Columbus home. But what does it mean once this exhibition is over, October 4th, you have until October 4th to see this, but once this is over, when you acquire these pieces, what happens to the pieces after the exhibition? Are they archived? Are they put on permanent display? How does that work? That is a great question, and it is a question that many visitors ask about our permanent collection. So when works of art are acquired, it often depends on the medium. So in the case of photographs and other works on paper, after, say, this exhibition, we will probably put this photograph in storage since exposure to light is harmful to works on paper, to textiles, to works that involve fragile materials where exposure to light is harmful. And then we'll uh, bring them out again after a period of months. And sometimes they're put in our permanent collection galleries, sometimes in special exhibition spaces. Sometimes other museums ask to borrow them and we lend them uh, our works to museums literally all over the world. Uh, in the case of this work, I should mention that um, there are two other works by Tommy Lanigan Smith that were uh, acquired by the museum along with this one. Another is actually in the Stonewall exhibition. And a third, the third is in an exhibition of, uh, about the relationship of folk art to modern art. And after this exhibition and that exhibition closes, yes, these probably will be put in storage, but we will, uh, and we, are try we try to be very conscientious about rotating works and bringing our permanent collection works out for the public to see as often as we possibly can. Icons like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera are celebrated for their tireless efforts for the LGBTQ movement. And really what this exquisite exhibition really displays in full blasting color is the commitment and the leadership of women of color in the LGBTQ plus movement. This is one of my favorite pieces, David. I think it just sparks complete joy. It's called Gloria and Charmaine by the amazing photographer Jeb. Can you talk about this piece and all the other pieces that might be in this exhibition like this? <clears throat> yeah, um, certainly. The uh, photograph above, uh, the title is um, Glory and Charmaine. And Jeb, the name of the photographer, she's a lesbian photographer whose full name is Joan E. Biren. And there are two photographs uh, aligned, uh, one on top, one above the other. And they do express this mood of joy. Uh, a lesbian couple, <clears throat> both African-American, uh, one almost bursting with joy with a big smile or a laugh. And <clears throat> then a self-portrait of the artist herself 
Um, and if the mood above is celebratory, well, we could call it a self-portrait celebratory as well, or in a way, defiant. The full title below uh, of the self-portrait is Self-Portrait Dyke, Virginia. She is standing uh, below a sign that points to the town of Dyke in Virginia, and so it's embracing this uh, traditionally derogatory term and being fine with it and self-identifying and being very um, assertive or even aggressively assertive. And the um, notion of defiance is just one of many moods in this exhibition that range from this extreme optimism, assertiveness, defiance, uh, to, uh, on the other hand, especially works connected with AIDS, uh, moods of loss and tragedy, <clears throat> and uh, everything in between. And um, not only are there many moods in the exhibition, but many media as well. We've looked at some photographs, we looked at a work of sculpture, but there are also works of, um, uh, well, we would call them uh, examples of ephemera or material culture that aren't the traditional fine art media per se, painting, sculpture, but rather um, uh, object, everyday objects that may often be ignored by art museums, but which are part of this exhibition because it's about chronicling the, uh, the history and development of the uh, gay rights or LGBTQ movement. And so you see, um, in this case I'm standing in front of, there's a comic book, there, uh, there are posters, uh, there are pamphlets. Uh, in, in another section there's a t-shirt. All manner of uh, objects that come from everyday life that are important signifiers of the um, LGBTQ uh, movement and LGBTQ culture. And I'd also love to point out the fact that we've got a wall of photographs that chronicle the very first um, what came to what became uh, gay pride marches or gay pride days. The first year after the Stonewall riots in the summer of 1970, there was a march that was organized by the New York Gay Liberation Front. And that movement was also, it also spread to Los Angeles. So if you look across this wall to my right, you'll see uh, commemorative uh, photographs uh, that were turned into posters that are, to me, uh, the uh, most, uh, um, the most powerful expressions of joy and celebration and uh, the, giving a, a visual, t almost tangible sense of liberation and the positive spirit that was in the air. Yeah, how do you, what's interesting is, I think this exhibition does a really nice job, especially if you look at it uh, when you come in and go in order. Uh, it's, when I see this coming out wall, it's, it seems to be almost staged. These photos seem staged and maybe not necessarily giving the full story of, our, of the people who, whose voices were so much a part of the scream and the shout for liberation, right? These, these black voices, these trans, trans voices. How, and I know it, it celebra the, this exhibition goes on to celebrate those stories. How did this, in the curation of this, how was that brought to mind and to light? Well, our curator, Jonathan Weinberg, was um, very conscientious about uh, being as inclusive as possible and finding as many uh, both works of art and uh, the objects of material culture that are connected with either by or that represent or in some way are connected with the wide ranging diversity of those who were part of the LGBTQ movement from the very beginning uh, in the Stonewall incident up until the closing decade uh, or the closing year of this exhibition. So um, you have, uh, if you look uh, through the exhibition, representations of uh, people of color, uh, African-American, Latino, uh, trans people, uh, even uh, people with disabilities. And it's very, in some cases, it was challenging to find uh, works by these artists or to find them represented in either uh, f fine arts or material culture. So it was really a quest to which uh, the uh, uh, curator Jonathan Weinberg and our in-house curators Drew Sawyer and um, 
uh, Tyler Can, uh, Daniel Marcus as well, to which they were all committed. And I think that if you um, go through the exhibition uh, with that in mind, you'll be rewarded in uh, finding um, and, and uh, being surprised by the diversity and range of uh, images and uh, people represented that you will find. I also am like really, like, I find it staggeringly awesome the type of, uh, of pieces that you mentioned that are considered art, right? I think we as, uh, as a community, as LGBTQ people, we have expressed ourselves historically through a variety of mediums, music, uh, our own films, uh, costumes. Um, uh, there's even a BDSM chair here that is in, as, as a part of the exhibition. I find that so wonderfully affirming to tell our story. Oh, that you bring up such a great point. Uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, the, the range of media is much wider than what I just talked about um, in, uh, so far as uh, including uh, video and uh, furniture, if you will, and puppets and costumes. And one thing that uh, Jonathan Weinberg, the, curate, the guest curator, was very concerned about was representing performance. And that's an art form that is the essence of ephemeral. A performance art is something that's done once in a particular time and place, and once it's over, um, that's it. If you didn't see it, you really haven't experienced the work itself. But with the, uh, per, many uh, LGBTQ uh, performances or examples of performance art through the years have been captured on video. And we have them in this installation on the many video monitors that you'll see throughout the galleries of the show. Without a doubt, this is one of my very favorite pieces in the entire exhibition. I know it's a staff favorite here at the Columbus Museum of Art, and I know it's an, an audience favorite who comes in to view this show. They rush to this piece. Divine, larger than life. Larger than life. I, I mean, so truly, true. larger than life. And you walk into this room, and because it is the exquisite artwork of David Hockney, your eye goes right to it. Yeah. I want to know, Nanette, first of all, how did this piece become acquired for this exhibition? And talk about the significance of having it a part of this exhibition. Uh, it is incredible that this picture is here. Uh, the very first thing it teaches us is how many lenders it takes to do a show like this. Mm -hmm. It takes dozens and dozens and dozens of people and institutions who generously lend works of art to an yeah. exhibition. Now, you've got to work for that. You've got to prove to those lenders that this is an important project because artwork actually is safest when it stays home. It's safest when it's on its own wall, in its own place, whether it's a museum or in your living room, it's safest there. So there's always risk when you, work, you, know, when you lend a work of art. Yeah. And so I think it's important for people to realize that that's a big part of organizing an exhibition. I always say that there are two exhibitions. There's the dream exhibition that the curator has with the perfect checklist. That's, I have, for every exhibition I've ever done, I have the perfect checklist. Mm -hmm. And then you have the checklist of what the exhibition really was, what could be, a, what was available. Maybe a work of art isn't available because it needs to be conserved or it's not available to another exhibition. You never know. Uh, but this, was, this is owned by the Carnegie, and we are endlessly grateful that the Carnegie lent this major work by David Hockney to the exhibition. And it is bigger than life. I mean, it is that, it just, it, it has power across the room, and then power when you just spend time with it. Um, it it's important, uh, so um, Divine was uh, a huge fan of David Hockney's, and asked Don Bacardi, who was an artist, uh, but was also the partner of, Dave, of Christopher Isherwood uh, to introduce them. And this portrait is the result of that introduction. And also it's important in David Hockney's career because it's a turning point in his portraiture. His portraiture earlier than this had been very much more kind of uh, literally true, photo, photographic, you know, not, not photographic, but much more realistic yeah. in its, in its yeah. approach. This is sort of a turn in the way he does portraiture. And he actually said of this portraiture, it is less literally true of Divine, but perhaps more true to life. What I love about it is that Divine is here not, as, as we've talked about, not in his kind of stage persona yeah, no. of, you know, the Pink Flamingos Divine that we all came to know, yeah. or Female Trouble, or even as Edna in Hairspray. But here's Divine in uh, what looks like pajamas and a house robe and almost serving this resting yeah. at ease 
an intimacy. And, and we it's feel so we intimate. feel intimate. We feel there's an intimacy here because we're getting to see another side of divine. And this is in 19, this was done in 1979. Yeah. He did so his like, mid thirties. You and I just did the math. Yeah. Mid thirties, yeah. and he'll be gone by 42. His age 42. He d he dies uh, in his sleep of uh, enlarged heart at the age of 42. So. It's it an is. incredible picture. And um, you had another question right before we were on camera. You said, how do you move all this yeah. stuff around? Yeah, because, you know, when you, I mean, I, as a big art lover and a, and a fan of, of museums and the work that you do, once this exhibition is over and, and we pack up the party, this goes back to the Carnegie. And so how does that, what's that process look like? Because it only lives here in Columbus for so long and yeah. then it goes home. And yeah. how does it get home safely? That's a, uh, safely. That's the, the theme of the uh, current uh, <laughs> period. Right, safely How's doing safely. Art has the same thing as taking care of art safely. Is what museums do, mm -hmm. and it's you know we uh, earlier in the tour you made David Stark. You're going to meet him again in this tour. So the curators are sort of the face of the of an ex of an exhibition, the face of a museum. People see the curators all the time, and this exhibition, by the way. We, it was the brainchild of Jonathan Weinberg, but there were tons of ex, uh, curators that worked on this exhibition. Uh, uh, Drew Sawyer, who now works at Brooklyn. Uh, Danny Marcus, who was our first Lichtenstein fellow, was, and Tyler Can, who's our contemporary uh, curator, in addition to David. So there was a whole team of people. Those people you hear us talk about. The people you don't hear us talk about are the registrars and the art handlers. And no project would be possible without the registrars mm -hmm. and without the art preps and the designers of the ex installations. Those people are sort of the unsung heroes of exhibitions. So what happens when the show closes is the registrars come down with their lists and they're working, you know, they're matching works of art with crates, with, with the timetable that who, who's, what picture's going back on what, uh, what truck. This will go, it'll be packed up, it'll go in its own crate, and it'll be a beautiful art climatized crate, and it will then go on a truck back to the Carnegie. So when you say climatized, that means it actually has its own... Some of them, they don't all, but some of them actually have microclimates in them. It's amazing. Really? Yes, yeah, some crates. They all have, you know, they're all specially constructed for artwork, but some of them actually have climate. I would have, yeah, it's fantastically fascinating. Yeah. And the time it takes, you know, when I've, you know, been director for a while, and so my job, of course, is to raise money and make sure mm -hmm. we're, we're safe and doing all of that. Um, and uh, you forget, but I started life as a curator, and I sometimes forget how long things take. And I'm like, why aren't we done with that? Yeah, why is that? Yeah. But it takes weeks to, uh, you know, to, to send all of these things safely home. And my favorite recent story is that we borrowed a uh, Titian, a high Renaissance painting from the museum in Dresden. And the painting arrived in its own, you know, crate, fr uh, you know, came in the truck after it had flown from Dresden. Usually when you have a crate come in, you keep it in the building for 24 hours so that it climatizes to the environment you're yeah. going to take it out of. So from the time, I, I made myself stand on the floor when we hung that picture because I thought, I need to remember how long this takes. From the time we rolled that crate across the threshold of the gallery that it would hang in, to the time we put it up, you know, literally just got it onto the wall, and then we were going to come back after lunch to light it. It was two and a half hours yeah. to hang one picture. And sometimes that's how objects of art move through time. They're able to stay safe because we care to take care but of But that's the point. That's yeah. the, and that's the importance of you viewing this at home and considering a donation, perhaps, to the Columbus Museum of Art. It takes a huge effort to protect these pieces, preserve these pieces, and put them on display for all of us to enjoy. So hopefully you'll be able to make it here before this exhibition is over. And if not, come to the museum at another point and make a sizable donation to continue the art here. There'll be another exhibition. That's right. There's, another, there's always more art coming, thanks to your support. So we've come upstairs now. This exhibition is so big that it is on two floors of the museum. And we're now in front of another work of art that is a particular favorite of Nina's. This is by Laura Aguilara. Uh, and it's, uh, tell me why, tell us why. I love this portrait because first it celebrates a woman of color. Yes. Uh, it's an incredible portrait uh, of a Latinx woman. And it also has a quote that you can't see uh, visible to the, to the audience, but the quote that says, I, I used to worry about, worry being, about different. being different, but I now realize my differences are my, my strengths. strengths. 
And I think that is such a powerful statement that still holds true today. This is 30 years ago? Yes, Over this was 30 done years in 1989. Yeah, and it's part of a series. Yeah. She did a series on uh, Latino women, and she was commissioned, uh, it was part of a, it was like a mental health convention or something, and she was commissioned to do this. And, and the reason that uh, Laura Aguilar was taken, she wanted to photograph different women to show this breadth of, you know, when you, you're, you're not defined by woman, you're not defined by just Latina, that these are all singular individuals. And I think that really is compelling. And many of the prints, as Nina mentioned, actually have inscriptions by the sitter. So this is a woman named Carla, and that was Carla's inscription on the print that she wanted, was to say, I now realize my differences are my strengths. So that's incredible. And that is so important today to hear yeah. that, especially in, in the conversations that are happening yeah. in this world, how art imitates life and how light imitates art. This is still so, so important today right. to say, my differences are my strengths. Who I am is, is, is important, is valuable. And this portrait celebrates that in a really beautiful way, as well as this, as you told me, this whole wall. This whole wall. This whole wall, and we're in the, we're in the we're here part of the exhibition. Yeah, which is the seven, we never said this, there were seven interrelated themes in the exhibition, parts of the exhibition, mm -hmm. and this is the last one. And this whole wall that we're standing on is a wall of portraits, self-portraits, yes. yeah. So, and I think that is something that's incredibly optimistic about mm -hmm. this exhibition. We talked about the different moods of this exhibition, but that optimism, that embrace of who you are and who you came on the planet to be, I think is at the heart of this exhibition. Well, I think it's really powerful too in an LGBTQ plus exhibition to be able to give the artist the, the power to sit in front of a camera and express themselves to be seen and to be heard. Yes, to be seen, to be heard. And to be and valued. To be valued. Yeah. I agree. I'm standing here with Gabriel Mastin of the Columbus Museum of Art in front of a really impactful, powerful piece by David Wanarovich that talks about the experience of growing up gay, growing up loving another boy, and growing up having to pay the price for that. And what's really interesting about this piece is um, how truly uh, powerful and yes. painful this is, I think, for many gay men. Can you talk about this piece a little bit, Gabriel? I think it's really moving that the artist here is looking back on his life and that the subject is looking forward at what he will have to deal with. And as a gay man, having gone through a lot of those things, this piece, I just stand there and I clutch my pearls and I'm brought to tears. And David was known as a very powerful writer, as also as an artist. So to have this piece on the wall of portraits, it's like I see myself personally in this the most, which this is we are here, this floor, so I'm here, you're here. So this piece talks to me personally, so I think it's really important. I think it's really remarkable. David Wanarovich uh, uh, notably died of AIDS, and his whole professional life, he was trying to talk and speak out against the censorship and the lack of the US government response to this epidemic. And it's just, <laughs> this is one of these moments in this exhibition that stops you and it makes you really consider all the things we've accomplished and all that we still have yet to do. Yes. I think that this is such a wonderful, wonderful period on a wall uh, that's dedicated to an artist's perspective and an artist's storytelling. Yes. I think um, now I'll tell you why it's important to be to be in the four walls of the museum, it's because you can see yourself on the walls. And our mission statement is great experiences with great art for everyone. And the LGBT community is everyone, and we are here. <laughs> and so please consider joining the museum. Go to our website uh, to the category Join and Give. And under affinity groups, we have a group for the LGBT community called Loud and Proud at the CMA. And we are actually the first museum in the country to have founded an LGBT formal membership at an art museum. And we have programs. Yeah, what you're telling me, so what you're telling me, I'm a proud Columbus resident, and I have loved this museum for its 
daring and brave exhibitions, but what you're telling me even more so for LGBTQIA plus Columbus, this is a home. This is the only exhibition of its kind ever in the country, the largest LGBTQIA plus exhibition ever in the country, and it's right here in Columbus, Ohio. It and is. you're telling me there's an affinity group for LGBTQIA people to have a membership here and supports their voices and their artwork? Yes. And your story will be heard and your story is safe here and we can have dialogue here. So come join us, please. How do we continue once this exhibition is gone? And this might be a question for Nanette or for David, but I want to hear your perspective as well. How do we continue to celebrate all of these voices once this exhibition is over? And what do and what do what are next steps for us? We, this is like a this is like a you know this is almost like a 101 yes. uh, into the into the LGBTQIA movement and uh, equality true. movement. So I think that the collection is so important, and our museum's collection and our committee on collections really values social justice. So we do buy we acquire art with a lens of social justice because when you do that, you get the stories, and stories bring art to life. So partially, it's our, it's our job to buy art that it does tell the story of our community. So we're committed to that. We also have a center for social justice and a gallery dedicated to it. Mm -hmm. So our commitment to the community is continue doing that. And how that happens is by you coming and joining us, your ideas, and supporting. Well, you've got a lifelong partner in me, and I hope you'll join us yes. as well. Thank we're you. very proud of this work here at the yeah. Columbus Museum of Art. You know, one of the great things about this exhibition, Art After Stonewall, is the fact that it features some notable Columbus artists, mainly Corbett Reynolds. Nanette, can we talk about Corbett? We can. And we are, there are two, parts of the two spots of the exhibition that we celebrate Corbett's impact on Columbus. One is downstairs. There's this wonderful wall of rudely elegant po uh, posters from all the parties, the red parties, mm. the black parties. Um, I still can't believe I lived here and I was never at a red party. <laughs> I, I know so many people that were. That I just feel like I was like, and I don't know, I was not <laughs> tracking. I, you know. uh, but the second space is up on the second floor, and it's this incredible wall. Uh, it's, uh, this is from a series that Corbett did that was called, uh, wait, it's called Total Liberation of the Unconscious. I always screw that up. Total Liberation of the Unconscious. He casts each one of these heads, which of course are based on a classical portrait bust, and then he alters them. Uh, it's really, it's a riff on uh, the whole idea of, of Dada from the early part of the 20th century, but very much with a Corbett Riddle spin. Uh, so Corbett had a huge impact on culture here in Columbus. Mm -hmm. He was an artist using many different mediums. He was uh, an entrepreneur. Uh, he was an impresario. Um, he was all things. And we uh, are extremely excited to be able to celebrate corporate as part of this exhibition. And it also brings up the point you and I were talking about, which is that exhibitions, even though it's all the one exhibition, each of the three venues, there's a difference. And so what we did at the venue here in Columbus was celebrate more of our own. And in fact, there's another piece that is very important in this exhibition. Almost everything in this exhibition is 1969 to 1989. But once we brought the show home to Columbus, we commissioned a piece, Nocturne, by a group of young trans and artists of color here in Columbus. It's an oral history piece. It is very powerful. We commissioned it for the show till we could have that young voice, mm -hmm. that next generation voice here. And we've also acquired it. So you'll get to see it even after the show. That's what's exquisite about this whole experience is that you are, we're looking to the past, yeah. uh, starting at the, at the beginning of the uprising and the riots, yeah. and then we, we put a punctuation almost on 1989, yeah. but then we say, wait, no, don't forget, yeah. there's something else here. There's yeah. more to the story, and you're excited to help tell that story. It is, and it's great to have the Columbus story sort of bookended with Corbett and this incredible piece, Nocturne. I, th I think this wall, it does <laughs> give, it's like the divine portraiture. Yeah. This wall does give the idea that Corbett was larger than life. And you, <laughs> exactly. have, you have this wonderful display of yeah. his work. And it looks out over, out, it's right across from the uh, glass looking mm -hmm. 
comes north. North. The net always gets that wrong. But anyway, it's powerful. So yeah, very exciting. powerful. Now, I have the really wonderful honor to stand next to perhaps maybe one of the most famous gay artists uh, of modern times, this, this uh, piece by Keith Haring. David, talk about the importance of this piece as we wrap up our tour. Well, I love the fact that this work is located towards the end of the exhibition because I think it makes a really nice closing piece. Well, first of all, um, Keith Haring began his career as a graffiti artist, um, literally doing chalk drawings in subway stations mm -hmm. and uh, 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 drawings on, uh, uh, in, on walls and in public spaces. And by the late 80s, he had established himself as a leading American artist and increasingly devoted his talent to causes uh, and uh, uh, benefits. And he was particularly a, a strong advocate of AIDS activism. And he himself was diagnosed with AIDS at about this time that the, this poster was painted uh, or created. And it represents his typical style, um, cartoon-like figures, solidly colored with outlines, and these rays, these lines, these ray-like lines emanating from figures. Sometimes they signify light. In this case, they signify action. And it's about coming out of the closet, the metaphor for um, gays identifying themselves as being gay. And the, there was a, a day designated the first time ever in 1988 by national gay rights advocates and advocacy, advocacy, advocacy group. Um, they uh, sponsored uh, October 11th or designated that day as a time of coming out. And this notion of aggressively bursting out of the closet and uh, affirming uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the self-identity uh, and the dignity of being gay is so beautifully expressed in this poster. And tragically, um, uh, it, Keith Haring died in uh, just two years after this poster was painted, uh, or this poster was created um, uh, at the age of 31. So there's a very sad and tragic backstory here, but the message is positive and the fact that this uh, powerful artwork continues to resonate today. By the way, the taping today is done in late September, so coming out day on October 11th is right around the corner. This is an annual tradition that continues, so uh, coming out day 2020 is coming up. So um, with this image concluding the virtual tour, I would like to thank Nina West for being such a wonderful host and guide for her remarks, for her wonderful questions, and thank you for making today and this event a very special one. We're oh. so honored and happy that I, you were part of what we're uh, doing today. I thank can't you. thank you enough for providing a space and providing voice to this incredible art and this incredible movement. And I do think it's very fitting that you mention that here we stand, this exhibition ends, its final day is October 4th, which is right before National Coming Out Day. It's almost like a saying, okay, we're gonna stop this, and the next chapter begins. And I hope you will have time to come to the Columbus Museum of Art and enjoy this exquisite, one-of-a-kind exhibition only here in Columbus, Ohio. Thank you, David. Thank you, Nanette. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you to the Columbus Museum of Art. Now, come experience art. <laughs>